All right. Uh, as Max said, today I'll be presenting on external validity, and this is, uh, and, and formally the title of the talk today will be External Validity for Social Inquiry, which is a book project uh, that's currently under contract with Cambridge University Press. Uh, I should note that this is co-authored with Mike Finley, who is on the Zoom call from UT Austin, and also Kiyosuke Kikuta um, for the Institute of Developing Economies in Japan, where it's currently 1 a.m., so I think we'll give him a pass for, for not being able to join right now. Um, but yeah, really excited to be here, really excited to receive everybody's feedback at the end, so thanks a lot. So let's start off today's talk with, um, the slides are not working, oh, there it is. Is 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 the full screen being able to be shown or is it yes. cut off? Yes, okay. perfect. Okay, um, so let's start off with the uh, dominant paradigm for social science nowadays, which is all else equal. And as most of you know, the idea is that you want to have internal validity in the sense that X, some independent variable, is causing Y, all else being equal. And recent Nobel Prizes in economics have really demonstrated the influence of this approach. So on the screen here, you can see uh, Banerjee, Duflo, and Kramer, who won in 2019 for field experiments and then Card, Angrist, and Imbens, who won in 2021 for natural experiments. And uh, of course, all else equal and making internally valid causal inferences is really valuable, and we should definitely strive to do that. Um, but for external validity, all else equal, as we'll show later on, is mostly complementary, but not necessarily. And, and external validity is going to be important because we really want to figure out whether our inferences are contributing to broader learning. Uh, I'll define that in a second, but for the meanwhile, um, I want to go over our running example for today's talk that'll hopefully put everything in context. So for today's talk, the running example is this Medicata 1 study, and what it does is it runs uh, seven different field experiments across six different countries and tries to test whether voter information campaigns foster political accountability. So for the economists in the room, there was a very famous study uh, from Faras and Finan in 2008 that examined whether randomly assigned audits in Brazil affected incumbents' electoral performance, and they found that it did. And this was a, a very influential result based on this all else equal assumption. The Medicata 1 study uh, does something similar, and it runs uh, seven different field experiments in six different developing democracies. And then the idea was that, well, if we find the same result across these seven different countries, the result would be externally valid. That was sort of their, their logic. And uh, they find uh, a null effect across the board. So now that we've have uh, defined, or now that we've gone over a running example, I think now ready to define external validity. So external validity captures the extent to which mechanism-based inferences from a given study samples apply to a broader population or other target populations. So some of you might see on the screen here that mechanism-based is uh, in bold, and we've sort of added this to, to really uh, have external validity be about mechanisms, because mechanisms is about the pathway connecting your cause to effect. And, and we'll get into this in a little bit more detail, um, but for now, I want to define the two different types of external validity inferences, generalizability and transportability. So as you can see on the left in the blue circle, uh, a generalizability inference would be if you took uh, data from sample S1 and uh, used that to make some sort of inference back to the larger blue population, that would be a generalizability inference versus a transportability inference would be if you took the data based on sample S1 and then on the basis of your results made a prediction over to population two in, in green. Types or four primary approaches to external validity, whether it's generalizability and transportability and whether the uh, the study is based on multiple samples or a single sample. So the most common approach to external validity is through generalizability with a single study type. And here, uh, most studies will use some sort of sampling technique that hopefully approaches random sampling in some sort of way. Um, in terms of generalizability that uses uh, multiple samples or multiple studies, 
Here we uh, have this category of same target synthesis. And of course, the most uh, common version of same target synthesis would be some sort of meta-analysis, right? Um, and in terms of transportability, uh, so I spoke about principled prediction before when I spoke about uh, in the previous slide of moving over from an inference uh, from, from that blue circle to the green circle. Um, that would be some sort of principled prediction. So for instance, if you're doing some sort of uh, health study and the population of interest is 50 to 60 year olds, according to your eligibility criteria, but you want to make some sort of prediction to 60 to 70 year olds, which are outside your eligibility criteria, that might be an example of some sort of principled prediction in terms of transportability. And then, of course, you can do that with uh, not just a single study, but multiple studies, and that would be synthetic prediction. So, um, but there are some challenges here. So, one big challenge is that random sampling may neglect causal structure concerns um, or uh, some sort of blocking strategy in terms of sampling, right? We need to think about that. Um, and we'll come back to, to causal structure a little bit later. And same target synthesis, such as meta-analysis, relies um, not only on the available studies with replication files, but on the uh, universe of studies that exist in the first place, which of course is not random. People don't just wake up in the morning and say, oh, I'm going to study uh, some random topic. They do so according to their expertise, right? And then uh, a lot of principled prediction or a lot of any sort of transportability inferences usually occur post hoc, which as we know now, based on the credibility revolution, um, we really wanna make our inferences design-based so that they can be uh, a little bit more credible. So now that we've gone over the different approaches to external validity, we wanna talk about the different dimensions. So as you can see on the screen, we've made a little flower of the six dimensions of external validity, starting with mechanisms, settings, treatments, outcomes, units, and time. And we have an acronym for that, MSTOUT. Um, and as some of you may know, uh, prior to our uh, 2021 annual review article, um, most, of the, uh, most of the scholarship focusing on the dimensions of external validity was using this acronym UTOS, Units, Treatments, Outcomes, and Settings, but we added uh, mechanisms in time uh, to, to the dimensions of external validity, and in particular the mechanism, because the mechanism is, is not only the pathway connecting theory and empirics, but it's, it's how your, your causal effect can actually be, uh, be possible, right? And we'll get into causal structure in a little bit, but um, we really want to focus inferences on whether the mechanism is actually going to be there for that inference. But actually, uh, these dimensions, this is just sort of only one way to look at the dimensions when we're actually making some sort of generalizability inference, so on the left-hand side of the screen, or transportability inference on the right-hand side of the screen, there are actually different levels of abstraction for our MSDEL, mechanisms, settings, treatments, outcomes, units, and time. And uh, continuing with our running example on Medicare 1, that was looking at uh, the effect of information campaigns on political accountability in developing democracies. The theoretical population would be uh, some sort of developing democracies, whereas the target population would be the individual countries where the uh, study was carried out. And the plant sample would be the uh, individual municipalities or districts in the country where everything happened. And, but there could be, uh, some sort of difference between a planned sample and an actual sample, right? Because there could be attrition, there could be non-compliance, there could be spillover, or if we're in an observational study, there could be all sorts of missing data. So at the end of the day, when we have our actual sample, uh, it might be very difficult for that actual sample and the inference that you can make there to generalize back up to that theoretical population so that we can do our learning. And uh, from our actual sample, we also, uh, we want to think about some sort of predictions or transportability inferences that we can make. And that also might be difficult um, if um, the actual sample, the, the representation of the actual sample is going to be very different from our theoretical populations of interest. Um, that may hurt our ability to do broader learning. 
So um, in, in the book and also in our previous paper, we looked at the, uh, the sources of external validity bias. And as all of you know, whenever you are interested in some estimate, it is a function of the true quantity of interest, which is either the population average treatment effect for generalizability or the target uh, population average treatment effect for transportability, plus some sort of bias, plus some sort of noise, right? And in the literature, there's really been a lot of focus on these internal validity biases associated with assignment selection and treatment heterogeneity. But what we show in our formal exercise is that sample selection bias and variable selection bias, both of which uh, are could be associated with external validity, although uh, we should note that, that variable selection bias could also be associated with construct validity and measurement, um, may actually overwhelm internal validity biases in terms of whether we're actually able to estimate our population average treatment effect or our target population average treatment effect. So what is our solution to these uh, biases that show up when we're actually interested in making inferences about broader learning? Um, so the big contribution of our book will be the elaboration of three evaluative criteria for external validity, model utility, scope plausibility, and inference credibility. And as hopefully the, the triangle on the screen makes clear, um, sometimes you maximize on one dimension, but you can't do so well on another. Um, but to the extent to which you can fill up the triangle and maximize on all three of these dimensions or these criteria, um, that's when your external validity inference is really going to be the broadest and most useful and most applicable. So let's get into the criteria. So model utility um, is uh, really has three criteria. It's about the query or the theoretical estimate, the mechanism, which is uh, very much associated with causal structure, and model correspondence. So in terms of the query or theoretical estimate, you want to define a clear, uh, a clear research question with uh, the estimate um, clearly spelled out in terms of theoretical populations. And also, you want to have some sort of unit-specific quantity of interest so that you can actually make the discernment about whether the goal is causal or descriptive. So is it potential outcomes? Is it some sort of individual outcome? Um, and, and that can help um, with, with model utility and really having some sort of clear theory, right? Second, we want to think about mechanisms and causal structure that are going to map uh, the mechanism to the treatment effects. And um, as I'm sure there's, I, I think there's a number of epidemiologists here, um, whether some independent variable X leads to some sort of Y outcome is always going to depend on support factors. And all external validity inferences require similar causal structures. So you can't have some sort of clear mediator or moderator blocking the path between X and Y. Um, but a lot of the shortcuts that we see in the literature is that when most people are making external validity inferences, they just think about whether the settings, treatments, outcomes, units, and time are similar um, and, and maybe that could be helpful, but it's generally insufficient if we haven't thought about potential mediators or moderators, or more broadly, the causal structure that's at place. And then finally, you can encode a lot of these uh, causal structure um, considerations into a model. So on the screen, you can see a uh, directed acyclic graph, but there's all sorts of different ways to be able to map causal structure, and, and think about clear research questions. Um, and, and this is important because a mechanism seldom operates on its own. Sometimes we pretend they do when trying to describe their natural outcomes, but that makes no sense. Mechanisms don't operate in some kind of platonic heaven all by themselves. They operate in real settings, and in real settings, other real things have influence as well. And that is a quote from Nancy Cartwright who has developed a lot of these causal cake or causal graph models. So uh, let's, let's put this into context in terms of our running example on voter information campaigns and political accountability, uh, Medicare 1. 
So in order, what the literature shows is that in order for voter information campaigns to foster political accountability, there needs to be some sort of salient performance in information that's publicly disseminated. Um, there needs to be access to that credible alternative information, either through free media or an NGO. Uh, you need to have an educated or literate uh, populist to be able to process that information. People need to express their political preferences, whether that's through voting or protest. And finally, people need to have some sort of freedom from poverty, um, because otherwise you're going to have some sort of clientelism or vote buying scenario where people discount the future too much and aren't going to want to hold their leaders accountable. Now, um, I could represent all of this in a directed acyclic graph. I don't know how much time we're going to have, so I'll sort of go through this quickly. But whenever you're making one of these directed acyclic graphs, or you're just listing these preconditions uh, for, for X to lead to Y, you need to think about whether there are some sort of selection nodes along the way, or maybe there's uh, some sort of moderator that might be able to influence whether X leads to Y. So the second evaluative criterion is scope plausibility which consists of three components, a target population, a planned sample, and an actual sample uh, slash empirical estimate. And that, that goes all together. And what scope plausibility is really after is the extent to which uh, study sample and population counterparts are plausibly selected and developed. So, um, and, and we'll be showing the, the different flower diagrams and, and how these correspond as we uh, describe these components. So uh, one of the things that you want to think about when picking a target population is that setting selection always precedes unit selection. You really need to characterize your settings. So one of the things that we see a lot is that you have some sort of randomized uh, trial. And uh, just because there is random assignment of the independent variable of interest, and maybe you even have a random sample, uh, people will just start talking about, well, hey, there's some sort of external validity here. Um, but, but that's not always the case. You really need to think about your settings, which might uh, lead us to think about whether there's some mediators or moderators at play that may not be, um, that may be difficult to deal with statistically, for instance. And then also you need to think about uh, that sampling frame that's really reflecting that theoretical population as you move from one top flower down to uh, the middle flower. And how do you do this? You need to have clear eligibility criteria for what you think constitutes uh, a population. And this, this eligibility criteria uh, idea comes from uh, a lot of work in epidemiology from uh, Isa de Habre and Miguel Hernan. Next, you need to think about the planned sample that you're going to use to be able to try to estimate uh, whether, whether X leads to Y. Um, and hopefully that has some sort of precise mapping to the target population. And uh, of course, to the extent to which we can do random sampling or plausible random sampling or, or some sort of block sampling, that is usually going to be a useful benchmark, but in a lot of cases, it's going to be really difficult to do random sampling. So we need to think about when we do non-random sampling, how does that planned sample actually correspond to the target population of interest? And finally, when we're picking our planned sample, we need to think about construct validity. So how are those measures that we're picking for our treatments and outcomes going to abstract upwards and of course, we can do some sort of validation exercise for that through uh, a convergent and discriminant validity. And finally, the final component of, um, of scope plausibility is this actual sample and empirical estimate. So again, we're moving down this flower diagram um, on the right here. And I should note that the, the actual sample and empirical estimate go together because it's about trying to figure out what remains after you've gone through this process of moving down from the theoretical population all the way down to the actual sample. And of course, I spoke about uh, attrition in, in experiments or missingness in observational designs. And, and of course, there could be noncompliance or spillover that might affect uh, our actual sample at the end of the day. 
But one of the things that the, the literature hasn't really uh, considered too much is the empirical estimate and how that's related to your identification strategy. So in particular, a lot of the natural experimental designs, such as instrumental variable or regression discontinuity design, are only estimating some sort of local average treatment effect uh, for IV, it'd be a local average treatment effect for compliers, for uh, regression discontinuity, it'd be a local average treatment effect for the units that are on one side of the cutoff or the other. And this is very much culling the actual sample even more from the planned sample. So we really need to think about these things um, when we're trying to figure out whether that estimate is really going to abstract upwards. Now, it could be that that regression discontinuity design or that instrumental variables design might be theoretically more relevant for whatever uh, theoretical estimate that you've declared at the start, but people need to justify this and just merely having causal inference without talking about the trade-off of, of unit culling is, is really going to make external validity uh, very challenging. So um, I think we're, we're running a little bit low on time here, but um, what we did in this little exercise here is we looked at the individual uh, causal structure considerations that I listed out before and tried to see using available data from VDEM and the, the World Bank to see the extent to which how the, the countries in Medicata 1 were represented in terms of their causal structure. And even though uh, the countries were selected by convenience, what you can see is that there's actually pretty nice variation on a lot of these causal structure points for the scope. So the final uh, evaluative criteria for external validity is what we call inference credibility which consists of three components, type one errors uh, and type two E or EV errors. We're sort of uh, fluctuating whether we should call them EV errors or E errors, um, some sort of mechanism assessment as well as estimation. So type one errors, as all of you guys are familiar with, it is about a false positive. And uh, what we see a lot in the literature is this, what we call EV harking or external validity harking. Uh, hypothesizing about external validity after results are known. And we're hoping that our uh, evaluative criteria here can shift folks toward thinking about more making these external validity uh, inferences ex ante as opposed to just thinking about them post hoc, which might uh, introduce some sort of biases. Um, of course, there could be some sort of false positive in terms of internal validity. Internal validity can be a useful input to external validity or power or um, all sorts of statistical concerns. And then finally, we really want to draw a lot of people's attention to what we call shielding, which are uh, the implementation decisions associated with um, your actually choosing which study to sample or, or for instance, in the experiment on Medicata 1, uh, a lot of the studies on voter information and, uh, and political accountability chose convenience samples based on where the researchers had pre-existing relationships with some of the authorities in question to be able to run these field experiments. Um, and then sometimes there were funding restrictions on what sort of things could be done. Um, and, and all of these implementation decisions that go into whether some... Uh, X is going to lead to Y may have an impact on what we actually see at the end of the day. And then in economics in particular, there's also been uh, a larger literature now on scaling. So if I estimate some treatment effect uh, in a partial equilibrium reduced form, how is that going to abstract upwards when uh, potentially at a more general equilibrium level or, or broader population, there might be some sort of mediator or moderators that might impact my ability uh, for, for X to really lead to Y. So that's a little bit about type one errors, but we also think type two errors are very important as well. And here, uh, type two EV errors would be when there's no reporting of external validity, when some sort of external validity inference is actually possible. And in our view, type two errors are actually more consequential than type one. Because a lot of times studies have potential external validity inferences, but they don't make them. So people have to read the papers and guess what is actually 
broader, uh, broader, broaderly ethical. Um, so, uh, and here we want to highlight two things. We want to think about journal policies. So in our review of the different journals right now, at least in uh, social sciences, uh, in terms of political science, economics, psychology, uh, sociology, we only actually found one journal, uh, psychological science, that makes it a requirement for all studies to make some sort of generalizability inference. Um, and, and we think that this should change. We think that every study should discuss external validity as, as a matter of course. And I guess I don't have the figure here, but we did a, a big exercise to look at the extent to which studies were um, in, in major psychology, psychology, political science, ex, um, economics, and sociology journals were making external validity inferences. And across the board, uh, across multiple years, randomly selected articles, we only found that around 40% of articles were really making those inferences. So, so we really, really want to, um, to reduce these type two errors. And then finally, in terms of type two errors, we see a lot of weird sample bias. So what are weird samples? Western, uh, educated, industrialized, and rich and democratic countries. This is a term from Joseph Henrich and colleagues. And what you see a lot of the time is that if you are doing a study on a country that is usually um, maybe smaller in nature, let's say Palau or Guatemala, um, the reviewers are going, or the editor is going to ask you to speak about external validity versus if you have some sort of sample that's from a, a big important country like the US or Germany or Brazil, usually there's not that same uh, impetus to uh, actually make an external validity inference. So uh, we think that this uh, practice needs to end and all studies should report on external validity regardless of what country they're looking at. Um, but we also wanna be clear, a study doesn't need to have external validity to be published. It just needs to report on it accurately so that we can all adequately learn from it. So another uh, important component of, um, of inference credibility is mechanism assessment. And uh, again, the mechanism is what connects uh, empirics to theory, and it's really the basis for our external validity inferences because we, we spoke about causal structure before. Is there really some sort of clear path for X to lead to Y? And you could do this empirically through some sort of uh, covariate analysis involving moderation, mediation, or factorial analysis, but you could also do this in terms of a directly to acyclic graph analysis through S admissibility analysis. And finally, in terms of estimation, we have broken everything down to three different approaches. Stout-based, again, stout is settings, treatments, outcomes, units, and time, non-parametric, and parametric approaches. So um, the primary sort of stout-based approach would be about replication, where you just sort of change one unit, outcome, time, setting, and then you see whether the result is the same. But there's also other types of uh, stealth-based approaches, such as specification curve analysis or sign generalizability, where you can change uh, any of these stout characteristics and see whether the result holds. That would be a stealth-based approach. Um, and then we see two other buckets, non-parametric and parametric. In the non-parametric buckets, you can look at balance testing to see whether the data in whatever um, sample you have are going to be representative of the population at hand. Um, you can also do this through some sort of uh, KS test or a QQ plot. And uh, also really big in non-parametric are subclassification, weighting, and matching. And of course, uh, part of that would be doubly robust techniques. And finally, um, there are some parametric techniques that folks can use as well, such as structural inference or outcome regression. Um, of course, parametric um, approaches are going to make the assumptions for an external validity inference and extrapolation a little bit clearer, but by introducing those functional form restrictions, maybe there's some sort of trade-off at play that you may need to consider when, when assessing whether there's actual external validity. So, um, so parametric may have this, this, this extrapolation benefit, but maybe that, that extrapolation or functional form might not have been useful in the first place, and a non-parametric assessment would have been a little bit better. 
So again, these were our uh, three evaluative criteria with the different components. Um, in the book, these are the chapters that we have in the book. We will actually, um, in, in part three, apply all of the evaluative criteria to all of the different methods that you can see on the screen, experiments, natural experiments, quantitative observational, qualitative methods, and research synthesis, and show how the individual methods fit within, um, or how you can use the evaluative criteria for each of these different methods. So hopefully this will be really helpful for folks. And um, just to, to sum up here, um, so we have talked about in this presentation a lot of challenges to social sciences' current dominant paradigm of just looking at all else equal, internal validity and causality. Um, and, and we really do need to take into account uh, causal structure, abstraction, selection, estimate choices and shielding concerns in order to have uh, a broad external validity inference. And in order to uh, ameliorate or address these concerns, we have proposed three new evaluative criteria, model utility, scope plausibility, and inference credibility. And we're hoping that these evaluative criteria uh, help everyone report on external validity as a matter of course. Um, so it's not just about false positives and type one errors, but type two errors. We really want everybody to talk about external validity and evaluate it in every article. So that's all for now. Thanks a lot for your time and definitely look forward to everybody's feedback. Thanks.